What's up guys, welcome back to another GGF mod build video. Now you can probably tell already, I will be going over the recent build in the 11 Mini Snow Edition. Now I've got a heap of gear in front of me because unlike some of the other mod videos where I sort of just go into detail on what I have performed on the build, I'm actually going to show you some of the things I have done in this build. So I've, re I've uh, replicated some of the things. I uh, like doing the fan stickers. A lot of you notice I, sometimes I just cover up the logo. Sometimes I add another circle, then another logo on top, just to clean it up. I'm gonna show you how I do those. I'm gonna show you how I do the frosted tubing. I'm gonna show you how I change. Some of you may not even know this, but the front of the chassis on this 11 Mini, on the EK reflection uh, distro plate that is designed for this chassis, the O-rings and screws are all black. So I actually changed these to white. So I'll show you how I did that and a few other things as well. But before that, a quick word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by CDK Deals. Head to cdkdeals.com where you can find the best prices on official Microsoft software and games from the likes of Steam, Origin, Uplay and more. For example, you can find Windows 10 Pro OEM for the lowest price around. Simply buy now and apply the GGF20 coupon code for an additional 20% off. Payment via PayPal is also an option I'm glad to see. And once completed, you'll have access directly to the keys via your accounts and email. To activate your Windows, simply start searching for activation and click the first option. Click change product, paste your new key and you're good to go. All right, so let's jump in. Now this video probably is going to go for quite a long time because there is a lot to cover. Now first off, I just want to cover what is the snow edition of the O11 Mini. You might be thinking, well, yes, it's just the white O11 Mini. Well, it is, but there are a few differences. So I would say there's probably three main things. Of course, you've got the, well, probably four, it is all white, but there is the original O11 Mini, which is all white, but a lot of people didn't like how it had the black frame around the glass. So it was basically all white, but then it had this black frame that a lot of people didn't like. And I'm actually glad that on this model, it is now all white along the side. Same with the front as well. You don't have that black border. It is a white border, which is nice to see. Another thing they've changed is the uh, cable grommets that go in the middle. It's a bit hard on mine because I have removed them. They come now gray. Not sure why they couldn't do white. I'm pretty sure they could do white somehow, but they have come gray. I think they've just done this to add some contrast. I did remove them, as I said, and I'll explain to you a bit later on why I did move, remove them. Um, but yeah, that's pretty neat because on the original one, they do come black. Another area are all the screws. Instead of being black this time, they are silver. So they're pretty much like a painted silver. I wouldn't say they're like a raw stainless steel color silver like you do get in screws. It's sort of a painted or chromish silver and that is all on the back all on the inside the accessories box that you get uh, for the case every single screw is silver whether it's the motherboard the ssd hard drive screws all those ones m3 and um, your 632 unc they're all silver so that's pretty sweet another thing are uh, all the dust filters are uh, all white minus the the magnets i guess it was a bit hard to go to that level uh, to get the magnets white but yeah they're all white as well. The hard drive cage is also white instead of black. To me, that's probably the most least important thing, being at the very back, uh, you're not gonna see it. But yeah, so that's basically it for the differences uh, in the models. So that makes it uh, three now. So they got the black, the original white, and then this all white snow. So the reason why I wanted to go all out on this build is I wanted to try and keep that tradition going with all the white gear, the white and silver mainly. I did sort of favor the more white side because there is a lot going on with this build that probably a lot of you haven't picked up on. You're probably thinking, oh yeah, this is just a clean build. But um, I'll go through the list of things that I'm going to cover. So that's basically a rundown of the difference with the snow model. Then I got the painting process. I actually painted uh, things like the distro, the blocks, both CPU, GPU block, uh, the distro bit of the white bit, that is the cover for the RGB, the D5 I painted, all the fittings I painted, and both radiators I painted, so I'm covering those. Uh, I replaced the O-rings in the distro, I replaced the screws. Um, pretty much every screw I placed that was an add-in part, like the blocks, the distro, any fan screws, all were replaced to silver. Uh, tubing, nothing really specific for this build. It is frosted tubing, but I did do that myself. I'll go through that. The motherboard cover, I've had a few people ask about this nice motherboard cover. If I was going with 
ATX or, or MATX, which I was originally going to go with ATX in this build. It does cover a lot more of the chassis holes and I wouldn't have worried about a cover. The reason why I went back down to ITX is with the ATX, you couldn't install a radiator up the top and I really wanted the two 360s just to keep that flow going with all the tubes. So that's why I went back down to an ATX, uh, sorry, to an ITX motherboard. And by doing that, it made the area much smaller. And then you could see all the holes around it. And that was a last minute decision I did to quickly rip up that motherboard tray. So I'll go over that. Uh, fan stickers and all that, that's really just that aesthetics. You don't have to do them. But if you take them off the fans I use, or look at the stock ones, they're just black. And that really wouldn't have gone with the build. Um, and then there's a few other things that you guys have asked, like when I was doing the time lapse build, um, I, for you guys who haven't seen the time lapse build, I'll throw a link up for you guys to check out. I installed, had to install two fans on a rad at once, slide the rad in because the distro had to go in first, then install the last rad, same with the bottom and the top. So you couldn't install all three fans uh, on the radiator and then slide it in, it just wouldn't fit. So I'll explain that reason, fan choice, is another reason mainly because I went so many times to try and get the right type of white when it comes to fans. I can't believe how many different types of whites there are when it comes to those. And also bottom fans blowing out. A few of you guys have asked why I did that. And then I'll follow up with temps. So quite a lot to cover. Uh, so let's jump into the painting process. Um, mainly when I do my painting process, I always stick to a matte color. I never really venture into gloss. Gloss will show a lot of, not really marks, but slight defects. Now when saying that, I don't paint and my work is that bad to have defects. It just makes things a lot easier when you're painting in matte. You don't get reflections. Uh, that's why things like your ceilings and all that, they're all matte. They are much easier on the eye and I think matte is easier to paint. Um, in my last mod build video, I used the same. This is Rust Guard by uh, White Knight. This is an SLS etch primer. A lot of my materials is aluminum, so I use this, and then I use my, this is also White Knight. Um, this says it's a paint and prime, but I always use a primer first. It's just so much easier to work with, and then this is just a flat white. The difference between flat white, satin white, and then a gloss satin, it's not re really worth it. You're either gonna get gloss or flat. Even sometimes when I'm using this, uh, depending on how many coats I do, sometimes it comes out a little bit glossy. So in terms of painting things like blocks, um, you don't need this one. You need something like a plastic primer. Uh, that's mainly when you're doing things like acetal box. I went with the full black acetal for this RTX 3080. Uh, so I prepped the, had to pull it all apart, prepped the, um, the main block itself, had to remove it completely. So I just had the acetal top, cover any holes that you don't want to get painted, like things like where the terminal goes on, had to remove all of that, cover that with tape, any areas inside the block where, where water would go. So I put tape on the outside of the O-ring so nothing would come in contact. I slightly sanded it all. Um, I don't think I got shots of the actual block, but I got shots of the actual terminal I have. So I lightly sanded it, scuffed it up because it's really hard to paint on glossy surfaces. So I scuffed it up a bit and then just made sure I covered all the holes on the terminal uh, put some uh, either stop fittings or just some plastic plugs that you may get on radiators. So I use this plastic primer, a few coats of this. Sometimes I may need to sand it down, fix up any marks, and then I can go on with the white. So basically, I do all my priming first. I'll do things like all the plastic first with this primer. Then I'll go into things like the, uh, where you have these FLT reservoirs, have, have that little aluminum cover on the side. I'll do the uh, SLS etch primer on that. I'll get that primed. The D5 was plastic, couldn't really pull that apart. I just taped all around that, uh, taped the top, taped the uh, where the cable comes out for your 12 volt and also your PWM, taped all that, and then primed that with this same plastic primer. Uh, fittings are pretty tricky. I removed the thread O-ring at the bottom and then I taped that up because you don't want to get paint on the thread because that is that won't get sealed by the O-ring because that's after the O-ring. Then I tape the actual, these are the quantum torque fittings I use on this build. Then I tape the actual bit that the tube goes in. So that's also sealed. And then I'll throw up a photo of it. It's kind of hard to explain. And then for the caps, I just don't have to really cover those much because they don't actually come in with contact with water. And then I prime those all as well. Uh, the main thing, I'd, reason why I go with the primer is it makes it a little bit more durable, but then it also eliminates having to go with a lot of coats because if you just start spraying white 
on dark materials, dark surfaces and so on, you do need a lot of coats to cover and then it gets kind of thick and chunky and especially because the torque, uh, the torque uh, locking rings have fine little grooves in, if you start putting too much paint in it, they'll eventually fill those gaps and they don't really look like the same rings. Um, in terms of painting radiators, they're not too bad. Um, some people don't like to paint the fins, They put uh, you can just put A4 paper in the middle. I don't really care, sometimes I paint the fins, you don't really see them, it doesn't really affect the performance. You're just gonna make sure you put some stop fittings in the four or two uh, G quarter threads for the ports to make sure you don't get any paint inside those. And then once again, I do use this SLS Edge Primer, so I get everything primed, get all that going, and then I go with the standard of all this white I got here. For the fittings, I do hang them all up, I normally, for the sort of the end fittings that the tube goes in, I just put them all on a flat sheet of whether it's wood or aluminum, stand them all up and then I just go spray at a time. Um, probably to do the fittings, it took me probably about six light coats. You can never ever get anything in like one, two or three coats. I do six or so coats very lightly, one at a time. Then I normally wait about 15, 20 to half an hour depending on how hot the day is and then I just go from there. So that's pretty much on the painting. I don't wanna to go too long on too many parts because yeah, it will go out for quite a while. Now moving on to the distro on the front. This is the reflection from EK. It's specifically for this chassis. Now the O-rings do come black. Now I do have a pretty cool little slide here to show you what it would look like black and what it looks like now in white. And I think it makes a world of difference having its white O-rings and silver screws instead of black o-rings and black screws. Now to do that, I just jumped on, you can jump on eBay, but I actually found a local place that does silicon rubber. I ordered a few sizes, I ordered three mil, uh, like a 2.4, 1.78, and the two mil is what I needed for this distro plate. I'm glad I got the three mil because that was actually the size of the pump, the D5 pump o-ring, so I used that as well. Now for doing these, you simply just completely unscrew. I've used an example of this FLT. So what you do is unscrew the top cover, pull out the old O-ring, and then you simply just grab the length of this, make sure it's longer than what you actually need. Then I just put it in the groove, trace it all the way around. Then you just, I just marked it with a pen. I make it so it's gonna be a little bit bigger, so then it just pushes it all out. And then you just get some super glue. Uh, super glue, that's good for plastic. A lot will do rubber. Then you just put a dot on each end and you just hold it together and it dries in about a minute. So I did that for every part of it. I leak tested and leak tested it so many times to make sure it was good. And that was pretty much it, pretty simple process. Um, it was just a matter of getting the right type of silicon rubber, which this one is. I did get one like these ones here, which look like, I don't know what these are. These are clear, these were stated as being white but they're kind of clear and they kind of look awful. So I am glad that these ones came that are pure white. So yeah, that's basically it for the distro. Now the frosted tubing in here, so normally I just order frosted tubing off AliExpress, but I didn't have enough. I think I had two tubes uh, normal and they were 500 mil uh, lengths of frosted. So I completely didn't have enough. I used eight tubes, eight 500 mil lengths. So I've done a quick little bit of a showcase video of the process of frosting these tubes. So basically I start off with uh, sandpaper. You need to use sanding pad. You can't use sandpaper like in the sheets on a block. That's just way too rough. You need stuff that is a lot softer. If you do use sanding paper and a block, it'll just rip straight into it. So I used a medium, then I used a more of a fine. You could probably go a bit finer than 320, but that's all they had. Uh, in terms of on the sanding pads. So basically I do two full runs up all, all the way, doing a bit at a time, rotating the tube. And then once I've gone all the way up, I do it again. Then I start with the final one and repeat that again. And that's basically it. So we'll jump in and we'll have a look at how I did it.
All right, so that's basically how I do the frosted trimming. And you can really see the difference is, I think it's second to none. It just takes away that, in that last shot where you saw the two tubes coming out of the block, it just really takes that glossiness and it's hard to actually see the tube because it's just one nice solid color. And especially with this blue, I think it just looks really, really good. Now just bear in mind that when you do, notice how I, I did all these before I bent the tubing. I think it does make it easier when it's in just one straight line to do it all. I do prefer to rest it on my leg. You probably noticed I was doing it on my leg because the tubing will mark quite easily. It's very prone to fingerprints once it's been sanded. And if you're doing it on a table, you're just gonna keep scratching it and you'll never be able to get it right because as you're sanding it, you'll just be scratching it on the other side. So I just do it on my leg and that works pretty good. But in terms of bending it, once you bend it, you will get a bit of a shine on that, um, on that bend. So I do go over it again, not necessarily with the medium, but I just touch it up with the finer uh, sanding pad again, again and that's how it came out really nice and all these bends it just all looks uniform as in the straight lines and then the bends all look uniform together. A few people asked the motherboard cover. Now this was very very last minute unfortunately I don't have too many shots of me making this. When I was starting the build mocking it up going to the ITX board I just noticed that where these grommets are they were just just way too big and there were a lot of other holes around there because as this 11 mini, it's designed for ATX, MATX. So they need all the extra holes just in this motherboard tray to accommodate all those motherboard sizes. So to do my motherboard tray, I just grabbed pretty thin aluminum. I think this was 1.4 millimeters thick. I just measure the height I want. So I pretty much went most of the, the height. I went a little bit from the bottom down from the top just so I can still pass things underneath and then pass cables up the top like EPS. And I measure how far I want. This one was a little bit tricky because most motherboard trays are just simply flat. You can just come out a certain point and just mark it off. As the O11 Mini goes out, it then bends on, I didn't really measure it. I simply just worked out how much I needed to bend. Once I got my overall length, I cut it all out. It was a rectangle. Then I just marked where I needed to bend it from. I just went over on the edge of like a workbench, got a bit of wood on it, clamped that down on the main side. And then I just simply bent it down. And then I went back a little bit more than I needed to. And then I just uh, off that back just a little bit more. By going past your bend, you'll get a sort of a sharper bend. And then when you pull it back, you'll get the bend that you need. So I just tweaked it a few times until I got the exact bend. And then I just went marking my holes I required. So I needed the 24 pin, and then I needed just a few other little holes, nothing too crazy like in there before. And then the finish on the motherboard cover is actually a vinyl wrap. I was thinking about painting it white, but I didn't really want to wait a few more days. And I think white would have just, in saying I was going with a all white build, I think it would have blended in just too much. I wanted to have a bit of contrast because Sometimes it's not all about just doing one color, it's adding a bit of contrast to the build as well. So I actually went with a really light brushed aluminum vinyl wrap. Now I do get all my vinyl wrap off uh, eBay. So this was pretty cheap and I've been using it in a lot of builds. From a distance it kind of does look white, but then up close it is uh, slightly gray and it does have that brushed look. Now that's pretty much it on the motherboard cover. Moving on to fan stickers and the vinyl cutting process. Now I'm gonna show you how I made these. I made these just before. So I do have a vinyl cutter. It is the brand called Silhouette. It is a Cameo model. Now these are about 300, 400 bucks Australian. And I think these are one of the best inventions around for doing things like these. If you're doing building PCs on a regular basis, they're actually for arts and crafts. So basically what it is, it's just a little cutter and it can just cut vinyl. It just connects to your laptop. There is a program that comes with it. You can do shapes, you can import logos, and that's pretty much it. So to get these fan centers, I just measure across on how large I want the circle. You can make them any size you want. You don't have to do the exact size on the fan. I normally keep it in between. A lot of fans have a little cutout where a sticker goes. I make sure I measure that exactly. Uh, go over to the software, create that circle, and then I simply create four of them. I, I normally create an extra one or two. Then I just uh, shoot that to the vinyl cutter. I have done a bit of a blue here just to show you what it would look like here. But in saying that, you could have probably used this in this build anyway. It would have looked all right. I've done blue just to show this uh, demonstration for this video. And then once that's done, I simply just take it out, out of the vinyl cutter and then I just stick it on each one. I normally go over the original stickers. You can take the original one off, but they are a little bit harder sticker and they normally do cover 
the very center of the fan, which normally has a bump there. Then once I got that done, I move over to whether I want to leave it at that or if I want to add a logo. Now, as you can see on these ones, I have added the Lian Li logo, and that's what I did in this build as well. So simply with that, with how this software work, it doesn't work with transparent images like PNG logos. It simply wants to just trace around a black and white image. So it'll trace around the black. So it's good to have a very large image. The larger it is, the better it is. If you have something really small, it's all pixelated, it won't get a nice trace around it. So get a large logo uh, in the software. You simply just highlight it. It'll trace around it. It'll cut it out. And that's basically it. I normally still make sure I've got the, one of the circles still in the software, just so I know that if I, if I do have that circle there, I know the size, I need it, I need it a bit smaller than that circle, because if I didn't have that circle there, I'd have to sort of re-measure it and all that. It's just easier to leave that, leave that there. So once that's done, simply print some more of those out, and then I just stick them on. Now, in terms of sticking them on, with the circles, you can just peel them off and stick them on, it's pretty easy. But when you've got stickers that have, or decals you printed out, that have lots of separate parts, you don't want to pick up each little bit with a Stanley knife because you'll never know where to put them back down. So that's where you use something called transfer paper. So you stick it over the whole object you want to peel off, and then it peels it all off in uniform in one go, and then you can transfer it back down. And in my case, I can transfer it back on the fan in one go, and that's it. And I probably did this for this video in about 10 minutes. So it's not too complex, you just need the right tools and it's just a bit of a learning curve. And once you get used to it, it's real handy. And not just for fans, you can do heaps of things with it. It's pretty much unlimited on what you can think of that you can use on a vinyl cutter. Now there were a few things that you guys asked about installing the rads before the distro. Now the distro has to 100% go in first because the distro actually does run down to the bottom of the chassis and it runs to the very top of the chassis. It's not just the size from here to here, which you can see, there is an actual plate. So there's no way that you could be able to angle it in beforehand. So that has to go in first. And then once installing three fans, I tried it so many times, you just can't, you can't slide it from the front. It just has to go in on that angle. So that's why I had to go up the two fans and then the last fan like this. And in terms of fans blowing out, I don't normally go aesthetics over performance. But for this build, I really wanted to keep the top fans and the bottom fans uniform, as in seeing the non-frame of the fan for the top. That's normally right for the top because that blows out. But for the bottom, you normally see the frame because you suck in and blow out. But in saying that, the performance hit, I don't think is going to be uh, noticeable. I got the side fans blowing in. And once I have the side panel, there's enough pressure because this whole back is open as well. I can hold up a bit of tissue and it completely sucks it in on this side. So when you look at getting the correct airflow for a chassis, you don't have to always have, uh, in terms of intake, it doesn't always have to be a fan. If you've got quite a few fans blowing out, it will suck in from other areas of the chassis if it is open, especially like this hole back here that is all full of mesh and grills. Now, another thing is the fan choice. Now, this is probably one of the things I spent the longest on. I was going, the obvious choice probably would have been Leanne Lee Uni fans. I do have plenty of these white ones, but these have been used a lot and these don't illuminate the blades. I wanted blade illuminating fans, not ones that just did the side, because I wanted to get that extra light. And you can see in some of this footage that having the blades light up, I think just looked really good. Another option I was going to go with was something was like noise blocker, but they just don't have that right type of illumination that I preferred. It's kind of dull and it's hard to see, so I just don't think you would have seen them as well. Um, my first choice, actually, I was going to go with the EK fans, EK White, Varda. These are the Evos, digital RGB. But the white is just, I don't know, it's just so off. They actually look yellow. And I think putting those in the build, it just wouldn't have looked right. So I eventually found, I had some of these fans, I had to quickly order these uh, like next day delivery. These are the Lianli ST120s and that's what I went with. And they are the same white as the Uni fans. So I knew they would have been right for the chassis because I already had these fans. I just needed a few more and I actually think they ended up going really good with the build. But in terms of you guys trying to do a white build, it's not really that easy because when you look at white fans, like these EK fans online, these look absolutely brilliant white. But once you get them, 
it just, I don't know, it's just hard to get everything to match perfectly. Even I must say, now, with everything in this chassis, it's not 100% white. I would say the main thing now that isn't white or not quite right in, compared to everything else would be the chassis. Because I painted the radiator, I painted everything else myself. Uh, even the memory matched the rest of the motherboard and everything I painted pretty good. Except I think the case still does have a bit of a purplish tinge on it. It's not as bad as what the Anley used to be. They had uh, changed their uh, powder coating um, companies they did use and it is a, a much wider than what it used to be. But I still think it is a little bit different. And one other area I didn't cover when painting, I also painted the motherboard as well. Because I do think leaving that black would have not looked as good. Now the only thing I did leave on the motherboard was the little, on the, uh, IO cover was a little badge that says PG for the fans and gaming. I just wanted to leave something there as a little bit of a symbol as to I was still using that ASRock motherboard. So that's why I left that there. Now lastly, I do want to cover our uh, temps on this system. Now I did try overclocking this 11700K CPU. I didn't really have much luck. Um, I spent probably an hour or so. Best I could get was 4.9. Anything over 4.9 needed some ridiculous voltage of 1.45 or plus. 1.5, it was stable, and I thought, well, I'm not gonna bother with that. So I settled with 1.49 all core at 1.36 volts, which is a bit of a shame because the single core turbo is up to five gig. And it's always annoying if you can't get your all core in Intel, especially your all core over your turbo because it's kind of, is there really any point? Because this is a gaming system and that's what I mainly would be using this for if I keep it up or not. I'm still deciding if I'm gonna keep it up because it does look really nice and a lot of effort did go into this system. So the rest of the components was the ASRock Z590 uh, Phantom Gaming ITX, the 11700K, the RTX 3080 Tough, and then we had the T4 Extreme 32 gig, 3600 megahertz. Now that is their brand new ARGB white. And I must say this looks a hell of a lot better than their previous black, or it was actually dark blue, but this one looks much better. And then we have a Cardia Ceramic C440 Gen 4, one terabyte uh, NVMe SSD. Now the 3080, I did a quick OC. I think it had like 150 OC on the core and 700 on the memory. Uh, nothing too much there. That isn't going to affect too much on the water-cooled uh, GPU. It was mainly the CPU. So starting off with Assassin's Creed uh, stock, NOC. So you're looking at 53 degrees uh, stock for the GPU and the OC was 59. Uh, bear in mind, room temperature was around 20 degrees. It has been a little bit colder here in Queensland or in Brisbane here in Australia. Now the 11700K stock was quite cool at 55 and then at 4.9 it was 62. Now moving on to Cinebench R20, I ran this for about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, the stock was 63, and then at 4.9 it was 74. So of course, overclocking that a little bit, and it was pulling 230 watts. So that's where the extra uh, temperature was coming from. The Far Cry New Dawn at stock for the GPU was 48, which was pretty cool. And mind you, when I'm meaning these GPU temperatures, this is junction temp. So this is quite new for Nvidia, whereas AMD has had this for a while now. So 48 on the junction temp, what we're used to seeing before NVIDIA brought junk junction temp is about 10 degrees here, looking about 38 normally on that 3080, so it was pretty cool. Now bear in mind, these are just two SE RADs. These are the thinnest RADs you can get from EK, because that's all that will be supported in this chassis if you use the 011 front uh, distro plate. So yeah, stock was 48 and the OC was 52 for Far Cry. Stock for the CPU was 61 and then 4.9 was 67. Far Cry just seems to hit that CPU um, a little bit more than a lot of other games I've tested. Uh, 3D Mark Time Spy stock for the GPU uh, was 53 degrees and the OC was 56 once again on that junction temp. And the 11700K stock was 57 and then at the 4.9 for the 11700K it was 63. So overall temps were pretty good. It was just that Cinebench R20, 74 degrees. Bear in mind these CPUs can go up to over 100 degrees. I think 150 uh, sorry, 150, 115 degrees is the TJ Maxx these days. So that is well under. The only thing that kind of really nearly killed the system, I haven't got it in the charts. I normally test A to 64 FPU test. Now these CPUs on the 11th gen now support AVX 512. I do believe that used to be in the server environment. Uh, when you run A to 64 FPU, it hits that AVX 512. If you have no offset, which I didn't really want to tink around and show you A to 64 and you guys would go back to some of my other videos where 
it isn't running AVX 512, so I just decided to leave it out. So the Ada 64 512 AVX ran the system at about 90, 95 degrees. Now you might think that's a lot, but if you look at the reviews for the 11700K, a lot of reviewers running this on a 360 all-in-one cooler at stock. Bear in mind, that is stock. They are hitting over the 100s running that AVX 512 subset. So that is uh, pretty intense and I just decided to leave it out. This is a gaming system. It won't be running any AVX stuff. So yeah, that's why I left it out. But yeah, overall, I was pretty happy with temps, uh, even overclocking. Even when I did ran the VCore at 1.5, which I don't really recommend, it was still under, everything was still un under 80s in Cinebench. So those temps were pretty good. But um, I think that is it on this video. I'm trying to see how long it went for, probably like 30 minutes or something, but yeah, it has been long. Um, I hope that has answered a lot of your questions. Um, it was a bit rushed. I just wanted to get this out soon after the time that's build did go out. I do want to keep it about a month or two and then everyone sort of forgot about the build. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I want to thank you guys for watching. Um, I do want to keep more of these videos uh, coming. I will do the time that's build and then I'll try and do a mod build video about a week later. I'll go through all your questions uh, about these builds and then I'll also throw things in that a lot of you guys may not have picked up. Things like the distro O-rings and some other painting processes and things like that. I do want to thank Leanne Lee for sending this case out. I want to thank Azrock for uh, sending the motherboard for this build. Team Group slash T-Force for the SSD and the memory. I've got some more kits of this memory I'll be using in some more builds, it's really nice. And of course, EK for sending out all their water cooling gear and that front distro. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.